This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. The idea of describing the Affordable Care Act in 15 minutes is so beyond comprehension that I figure I can stall up here for four or five and cover it just as well. Um, there's just no possible way. I found this very quick summary and I really want to stick more to some global concepts. Sort of what we're trying to do with the Affordable Care Act as we're looking at how we implement it is really uh, looking at, just sort of going down the list, obviously quality care for all is both quality and affordable, but we are really working on some of the quality pieces. The role of public programs, which we're sorting out, back to quality and efficiency. Prevention is something new. Uh, we're looking at the healthcare workforce. We are committed to transparency and integrity. I think that's a big part. This should not be a black box that's secret. We have to have the ability to innovate. Fortunately, in CCS, we've been well ahead of that, uh, and revenue provisions, I always like that last little statement. One of the goals of this is to really try to do much more in the way of integrate and defragment, and that's really the message I want to talk about today. Uh, this was one of my favorite images. This is just the computer printout of the first day of the Affordable Care Act. There are three more piles like this. Um, I am not going to stand here and claim to be an expert in all of these pages of everything, but certainly there are multiple, multiple aspects that I think are bringing some great changes to health care. One of them is we're going full circle. As you can see, we have our police, fire department, health care, other government agencies, uh, sort of all segregated into a little box. Well, health care doesn't work this way. It's spread out and diffuse. Actually, it's so spread out with what are called centers of excellence, or we renamed them silos of excellence. Everything is so fragmented that we actually would like to get back to a more monolithic approach, that especially children with special health care needs don't have to navigate 15 or 20 different programs, different services, different everythings. Uh, what we have right now is a confusing mess. Uh, talk about CCS. Proudly, we are the oldest managed health care program in the United States starting in 1927. Not always a popular thing to say, but we have been around the longest for that. Currently covers, and I'm going to get to one of the biggest problems with the program, covers 175 children that have CCS eligible medical conditions. We don't cover the whole patient, we just cover those conditions. So you've got fragmentation by definition which we're working on getting rid of. Uh, it's not a small program as an insurance company. It's a 1.8, almost now $2 billion program up to age 21. We certify all of the different levels of pediatric care, including the providers. And we work with both dependent and independent counties on medical authorization. And to be in CCS, you have to have three criteria. You qualify medically, el residential eligibility, and then financially. We have chopped up all the hospitals in different parts. I don't want to belabor this too long, our different hospital systems. To give you an idea of what we're dealing with in California, this is the CCS State of California map. If you live down here in LA County, you've got lots of things all over the place. If you live up in the rural north here, as many of you are familiar, uh, the distances are somewhat greater than right down there. Uh, I could actually fit almost 34 different states into this map on things we have. If you think the Bay Area is real concentrated, it's actually not. It's pretty spread around. Then you have Sacramento. But as far as from here on the I-80 corridor, the next thing north is Portland, Oregon for a true tertiary center. Again, some rather big areas that are underserved. But the, the, the main point for here, we right now have 250 different special care centers all of which are supposed to interdigitate and work in a truly seamless manner, I wish. Uh, we're not there yet. We're trying to get there. I think many of you live the frustrations of our fragmentation. 
Um, this is a thing where I want a waiver, I want a waiver, I want a waiver. As the government programs are getting better at trying to bring things in, we keep coming at them with, we want waivers for this, waivers for that. We actually are starting a waiver program that really, I think, exemplifies all of this ahead of time rather than fighting. We have our 1115 waiver, but what that really is is under the Affordable Care Act underscores the goals of what we're trying to achieve. And I really want to emphasize this. Improved outcomes, better cost effectiveness, coordination of care. We need to defragment this. Our poor families can bounce to six and seven places in a day, which I think is terrible. Obviously, public dollars figure out transition. We want to have satisfied customers. That's the doctors, the families, the patients, all of that, the providers, all of them are part of that. There needs to be accountability. We're measuring access to care. This is a big one. We really want to get to family-centered care, having the medical home in a vertically integrated manner. We're not there yet. And then maintaining the regional provider network. One of the things with CCS that we've been very strong about, we right now have an excellent system of regionalized providers, that whole map I showed you. The goal of the Affordable Care Act is not to dismantle that. It's to anything strengthen it. So as we've talked about how managed care is evolving into this, maintaining the right patient in the right place with the right provider is still first and foremost of our program. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides of the Affordable Care Act. One of the things that came up with the Affordable Care Act is physician reimbursement has gone way up for certain physicians, and I got the entire program into one slide. Um, this is usually an hour talk by itself. But what this does is Medicaid fees for pediatrics, medicine, primary care, and subspecialists now go to Medicare rates. So there will be federal funding to make them pay at Medicare rates. Because historically, California has paid the lowest rates in the country, we will be the biggest beneficiary of this because we have the biggest gap to make up. And so for all of the physicians and the allied health people that report to those physicians directly, I'm getting real specific. I didn't make up the law. This is how it is. For all of those people, I will say plus or minus a little bit of error, the fees for inpatient, outpatient, all of those things functionally double from Medi-Cal. Uh, there's a self-attestation process that is up that people have to fill out, just went up. This program started January 1st of this year. So it's already in place, although the federal government only gave us eight weeks notice to do that. We can't reprogram our computers in eight weeks. Can't even read the bill in eight weeks. So anyway, this is a great thing. It goes for two years. Uh, we can speculate about afterwards, but I cannot think of anything that will improve access in the state of California for specialty care than doubling what we pay people. We can make all kinds of papers go up, down, and sideways, and to me, nothing will substitute for that. Uh, unfortunately, it's taking us a little while to get into this. A few minor nuances. You must be board certified by the American Board of Pediatrics for the pediatric subspecialties or the other ones, period. Not board eligible. Uh, if your specialty isn't recognized by the American Board of Pediatrics, which child neurology is the most common one, then you're not part of this. However, there is a second way to get in, which is if 60% of the number of bills you sent in, claims, for your Medicaid population in the previous period of time, if 60% of those fit these codes, then you're in. And that will deal with the board eligibility thing. We went back and forth with the federal government to get some relief and we're not successful. The rules are the rules, but I'm very excited about this. This is like, uh, once we get it up. It took us six months to get the self-attestation site up in this 24-month program. I was hoping that people would start seeing the accounts receivable getting their money by August or September. I think it's August already, so uh, I'm more fearful it may be the first of the year. We don't have a date yet. Okay, what's the more concrete part of the Affordable Care Act that I think people have heard about and thought about? And this is what we call Covered California. That is the California version of the universal health care coverage of really covering everybody and getting them on this. And I got to use my terms more carefully. Covered California uh, has gotten started and going. It's, uh, I think, been uh, excellent in how they're looking at it in that they're providing a range of benefits more broad than the federal minimum. Uh, it's the Kaiser small business model. 
uh, plan uh, for and particular for the audience sitting here on this topic. I think many of the habilitative and behavioral type services are more broadly covered than federal minimums and are more broadly covered than by Medi-Cal. Uh, it's a moving target. I don't think it's all fully set yet because we have other programs that you throw in that get a little confusing. But I'm very pleased that this looks like it should be rolling out pretty well. Uh, I think the 152 days you see there is correct because I pulled it last night, so it's probably 151. Um, but it's coming fairly soon and we're trying to get, uh, get it going. People have asked me, what do I see the impact to CCS of this? And I would say, I think most of the kids with the really serious conditions are already getting into our systems. I do not expect more kids with cancer. I don't expect more kids with heart disease. We're covering them all now. I do expect more kids with minor stuff. Uh, a heart murmur that needs to be sorted out that in the past would be thought of as not a big deal. We'll probably see those. Um, some of the, I will say a lot of the behavioral things I think is people are getting more used to it and understand it better. I'm hoping we do see more of that coming in, but we will we'll see, I don't know. I expect, we don't cover mild asthma, but I think you'll see more of those things. Primary care lightweight things, but we've looked and we could not even in any model come up with a child in California with congenital heart disease that isn't already getting care for. So I think in that regard, we've done really well with that. What are the six primary values of covered California? And again, it's similar to the rest of them. Consumer focused, affordable, catalyst. We want this to be a catalyst for future healthcare changes. Some of which we understand we don't know yet. Uh, when I went back to our 1115 waiver, we're looking at different models of how to try to better our vertical integration. We're not sure which one will work the best. Everybody loves these afford uh, accountable care acts, ACOs or organizations, I'm sorry. ACOs, but still it's like the unicorn. Everybody knows what it looks like and nobody's really seen one that's fully working. So I'm curious, we've got a couple models that we're looking at that I'm very excited about. Very focused though. Partnership, I think we've all learned with all of this morass of the multiple silos and factors we have. If we aren't partnering with the community, if we aren't partnering with everybody, it's not gonna work. Uh, consumerism is something to me that is huge. We need families to speak up. That is a really important point. I'll get to that in a little bit. For me, the last one is results. Um, outcomes are very important. We now have enough statistical brains around to know that it's very easy to set up a study that you know at the end of it you won't have an answer. I think we need to learn how to do better than that. It's called a type two error, and we're working hard to not have those such that we assess something knowing full well at the end of the assessment we won't be able to tell. There's no value to that. How does autism, and I will now use the old term PDD, fit into this, and how does it work with this? Um, number one, there are multiple programs in California. You guys can teach me about the fragmentation and the pain that everybody goes through jumping through different things. The long-term goals are defragmentation. Really get this into family-centered, medical home-based, vertically integrated where you have more either one-stop shopping or not bouncing around to place to place. As we've recently learned in some other discussions we have, we can send parents to three people in the same type of system and they may have the same computer system at each of the three hospitals. But even if you have the same computer system, they can't talk to each other. The one mom who has mastered this drives around with a trunk full of records. And I think she's the only one who's mastered this. So hopefully we can work on that. We really want a seamless family-centered medical home approach in the cascade of programs. Balancing that with, as I'm working with several foundations and they're looking at how can we more involve the families as case managers, going be careful. You're asking people very stressed to navigate an impossible system who don't do this all day every day. You don't want to assign it to them because then they're gonna get rid of those other FTEs and you're gonna have people not, that's not what they should be doing. So we have to balance that. We want family in input, we want family involvement. I don't wanna be dumping on families. And I see that, see eyes lighting up when we talk about that. Ooh, I can have less case managers on my payroll. That's not the goal, at least from our side. 
healthcare education continuum. The Department of Education over here with its programs, Department of Healthcare Services over here with its programs, how do we interdigitate besides poorly? Uh, we want to work on that being better and more seamless. It's poorly defined. There's non-uniformity of benefits. Um, that's one thing that drives me crazy. Um, what's covered, what isn't covered depends upon your health plan, depends upon all of these different things. It also depends upon what the st state legislature feels like funding. So they may approve something but not fund it. And so I have to sort of live with how do we implement unfunded mandates. This is one we're really trying to get to be the same. You shouldn't have different benefits. Consumerism, again. In our program, sadly, the way it works, and I'm trying to get this changed, every time a managed care plan tries to send the kid to CCS and we say, no, this is really your responsibility, the family gets a notice of action that's a denial. And I think that's tragic and inhumane because we are telling them the state of California has decided your kid doesn't get this covered. When that's not the case at all. It's that, no, it's the responsibility of someone else. So we're trying to get that changed so that we are not subjecting the poor families to that. Because they get that after being angry and depressed and working through all that. Then they go, what do we do about our child here? And to me, that is not our goal of trying to make this a more uh, patient-centered, consumer-friendly type of experience. So we're working on that. Uh, that's one of my crusades for the next year is to just say, this is wrong in how we process that. OK, a couple other things. This is the big problem. The state passed lots of things. But at this moment, autism is very clearly, definitively excluded from Medi-Cal. Uh, it is. That's the law. I, I, until that is changed, and until that change is funded, it is still excluded. We do work with our EPSDT mental health services as a way to try to get around that and use the EPSDT program to help do that. But right now, you can pick up uh, the, the, the laws, the regulations, all of those things. I've got nine of them sitting right there because I had to make sure I was a million percent sure. But at this point, including in the new legislation, it's carved out. SB 946 mandates a task force, Medi-Cal managed care is excluded. So they're not, it's very specifically out there. We're using the EPSDT as a way to try to help achieve this and get over this. Uh, we also have our regional centers, but be it known that at this point, most of the regional centers, I will say, cover about a third of kid, kids with autism or I'll say with the spectral disorder. They don't cover all of them. So again, we've subjected our poor families to trying to navigate this morass of confusing programs. We are working hard to try to bring them together, but if I was to stand here and say it's all fixed, one, you wouldn't believe me, and second, I would be really dishonest. So on those cheery notes, we still have some work to do. We are working hard to get this implemented. We are working hard to make this family-centered. We need consumerism help. I think you guys are very powerful voices in trying to get things accomplished and changed. I can also tell you, please encourage your families to file appeals. Uh, if they get a notice of action from us, uh, we are required to send that out. We read all the appeals very carefully. We uh, are very supportive of trying to do what's best for the family. I'm not very supportive about trying to, def uh, trying to induce further fragmentation. So our rate of overturn is pretty high. Uh, there are more formal appeal mechanisms through the other departments, and those rates of, uh, uh, I'll say, uh, a successful verdict for the family are also quite high. I think that's probably available information that's running about two thirds. On that, I'm going to go ahead and stop and thank you. I think the future is really looking bright on this. I think we've got some hurdles to overcome. Uh, I don't want us to rest on our laurels that we're making great progress. Uh, I'm not trying to leave here that the cup is half empty, but I am going to leave here and say it's only half full. So we've still got some work to do, and I'm looking forward to that. So thank you. The Affordable Care Act is overlaid on a body of California law that's really quite strong on protecting individuals with autism and other mental health 
uh, parity diagnoses, that is severe mental illnesses. So what I want to do is focus on the battle that you will have to do, not only with appeal, but with your insurer or HMO. And I want to lay the framework for you and give you, you know, maybe you already know this, but the reality is insurance is a business and it is designed to make money. It used to be at the time that I was an undergraduate at UCLA studying with Lovas that an insurance agent or broker took pride in servicing you as a customer and viewed his or her job as giving you compensation fairly for your claim as rapidly as possible. But insurance companies have gone to um, market conduct examinations and have been advised that that is really not their duty at all. Their duty is to maximize profits to their shareholders. And the way they do that is by denying claims. And there is a book which I have read and found extremely useful because it epitomizes the new way that insurers, and I include HMOs in that, do business. And that is first, they delay. They don't give you a denial. They string you out. They tell you things like, well, your doctor doesn't recommend it or it's really not appropriate. So the first approach is delay. The second one is deny. Deny coverage. You can't have it for a variety of reasons. And you probably know this history as well as I. I'll get to it in a minute when I talk specifically about Senate Bill 946. The first in the three Ds is defend. So if you file a lawsuit, they will hire people from very uh, prestigious law firms to argue, as Blue Shield is now arguing in the Court of Appeal, that people with parity diagnoses are entitled to the exact same thing that people with physical conditions are entitled to. No more, no less. That, of course, makes no sense. But this is the framework that insurance companies are operating from, so you have to advocate for yourselves, for your patients. And I will give you some tools to assist you in doing that. The first thing I want to tell you about is the mental health parity law. California in 1999 adopted this statute. It's very clear and it's very specific. And as interpreted by the Department of Insurance, it requires that all medically necessary treatment be provided for all parity diagnoses, including autism. The only exception to that is if there are limits on financial terms, such as annual um, dollar limits, co-pays, or deductibles, those limits can apply equally to all benefits under the policy. Other than that, any treatment that is medically necessary should and, in fact, must be provided. In fact, we know that the mental health parity was not complied with. There were all kinds of reasons asserted why children with autism shouldn't get behavioral health treatment. Those included, first, when I came to DMHC in 2002, the argument that this treatment was experimental and investigational. Now, I had identified a few things that I thought were extremely problematic, like rescission of insurance coverage, because I was there to look at systemic abuses. It had not occurred to me that treatment for autism could possibly be considered experimental or investigational in 2002, because the seminal studies were done in the 80s. But that was the position that was asserted, shamelessly, <laughs> by the HMOs with which we were dealing. And the same assertions were made by insurance companies on the insurance side. So the tool that you have is seek independent medical review. That is available in both departments and it is performed by independent clinicians who will look at the medical necessity of the treatment. Now that's particularly important for other kinds of treatment modalities other than applied behavioral analysis, like floor time, for example. 
I understand that providers are having a lot of difficulty if they don't provide ABA. They provide some other kind of behavioral health treatment. 946 is clear in requiring that. Nevertheless, I'm hearing that there are a lot of denials. So the tool that you have is appeal, seek independent medical review. Those independent clinicians are bound to follow the insurance code or the health and safety code. They look to the medical literature, what is recommended, what is required, and what is specific for this individual. With independent medical reviews, just as we saw in 2008 and 9 in the Department of Managed Health Care, those reviewers will begin to overturn denials. And at the point that 15 out of 16 of independent medical reviews came back saying, no, this is the standard of care, then the insurers changed to a different argument. And they argued that, oh, gee, this is not medical at all. This is educational, so it's not covered and you can't have it which illustrates the importance of reading your contract. Exclusions in your contract have to be clearly and conspicuously pointed out. And the standard is how a reasonable person, that is you, your parent, your provider, you interpret the language. So if it says you will get medically necessary treatment, then that is enforceable in addition to the requirements of the law. So that's, that's the first line of approach when you get either a delay or a denial. There is a Ninth Circuit, of a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal decision in Harlech, the only decision of um, any significance interpreting and, and really thinking about and articulating the scope of the mental health parity law. It came up in the context of eating disorders another parity diagnosis. And the decision is very useful because the same standards apply when you're dealing with any of the parity diagnoses, including autism. In that case, the policy at issue, it was a Blue Shield policy, excluded residential treatment for eating disorders in three different places in the contract. But it included treatment in a skilled nursing facility up to 100 days for people who had physical conditions. And the court analyzed the contract and said, no, it's not covered under the terms of the contract, but it is mandated by the mental health parity law. So even if you have an insurance contract that specifically excludes, as some did, LOVAS treatment or behavioral health treatment, that exclusion is not enforceable, it's not legal. That's the good news in the courts. The bad news is, as I said earlier, Blue Shield is challenging the scope of the mental health parity law in another case, which I'm working on an amicus brief to file um, shortly. And the scope of the mental health parity law will be determined in the next year or two. I think the second case will probably go to the California Supreme Court. But in the interim, although you will see arguments that there is a state court decision that says parity means equality, the very same treatment for physical and mental conditions, that state court decision is not citable because it's not published, and it's on appeal. So that's why it's important for you to go to the specific provisions of your contract and argue. If there is not equality in those provisions, then they're not enforceable. I handled a case against Anthem, which I settled recently, where they imposed a $2,500 limit on speech therapy. And they argued, well, that's fair, because nobody gets more than $2,500 worth of speech therapy. But of course, people with broken legs or kidney disorders don't really need speech therapy the way children with autism do. So because there were other provisions in the contract that allowed speech therapy when someone was in a skilled nursing facility or got home health care, I was able to argue persuasively, no, even if you're right that parity means the very same equal treatment, you don't meet that standard. So the visit limits are now eliminated both consensually 
and by our emergency regulation. So Senate Bill 946 was necessary in the mind of Senator Steinberg because insurers were routinely violating their obligations under the mental health parity law. And the, one of the purposes, one of the primary purposes for the parity law was to give adequate treatment to people with severe mental illnesses, but also to shift the burden from governmental payors to insurers where it properly belongs. So that purpose would assist with people who are being denied by you or your organization saying that, no, it's not our responsibility, that's absolutely right. It is the responsibility of the private insurers who collect premiums in order to provide coverage. If they're not providing it, hold them to it. So Senate Bill 946 reflected awareness that there were all kinds of arguments being made by insurers, and one of the primary arguments was that treatment for autism, behavioral health therapy, is educational. There is a Supreme Court of the United States decision that puts that issue to rest. I've cited it in my, t my materials. You should use that if you're continuing to see an educational exclusion argument for coverage, and it says, quite clearly that the definition of what is educational is what a child needs to succeed in an academic subject and advance from grade to grade. Behavioral health treatment has no relationship to that definition. It may have educational aspects, but so do the instructions that come with your prescriptions for Lipitor or anything else, and so does all therapy have an educational aspect, but that doesn't mean that it's not a medical service and it's not covered. So Senate Bill 946 is a specific mandate for behavioral health therapy, and it lays out quite clearly who must diagnose, it must be a licensed individual, and who must provide treatment, and it divides those treatment providers into three tiers a provider, a professional, and a paraprofessional. It also eliminates one of the later arguments that we saw in both the Department of Managed Health Care and the Department of Insurance that only a licensed provider can give these services. It specifically says that someone who is certified by a nationally certified organization, such as the Behavior Analyst Certification Board, can provide and can supervise these services. So the argument that is still being made on the Department of Managed Health Care side with the department's concurrence, and again, on appeal, that there must be a licensed person providing the treatment, I think that that position will not survive the appellate argument next week and uh, I'll keep you posted. I'll let Robin know what the outcome of that decision is. You still are seeing, as I mentioned, that there are denials for other kinds of behavioral health treatment. Again, go to IMR and let us know what you're seeing. That's the only way that the department can protect you. And what we have done to protect individuals is promulgate an emergency regulation on autism. We did that successfully. It was approved on March 13th of this year. We're now working on permanent regulations. And in order to get an emergency regulation passed, you have to show that an emergency exists. I showed that by saying there's a public health crisis in California, as all of you know, and by showing how much money it costs the government to pick up treatment that insurers should be providing. So I had the $800 million that the regional centers would be saving by not having to provide this treatment, and all of the attendant costs of special education, habilitative services, and ultimate institutionalization if children don't get the behavioral health treatment that they need when they're two and three years old. So that was successful, and it is quite specific. 
all of the things that we had seen that were barriers to treatment are prohibited by the emergency regulation. It prohibits visit limits for behavioral health treatment, for speech therapy, for occupational therapy. It prohibits dollar limits on such coverage unless that dollar limit applies equally to all benefits under the policy. So the $2,500 on all speech therapy limit, no longer valid for anybody. And then as to behavioral health treatment, it prohibits denials or any unreasonable delay on all the bases that we had seen, that there's a, an asserted need for cognitive or IQ testing, that the treatment is experimental or investigational or educational, or that an autism service provider or supervisor isn't licensed provided the person is a BCBA. We're now working on a couple of additions to those prohibitions for the permanent regulation, and those include a prohibition against denying coverage for supervision of at least one hour for every 10 hours of treatment. We weren't able to include that in the emergency regulation because we didn't have any complaints about it. So that is exactly why you need to come to us so that we see what's happening in the field and we can address it. You would think that this would be so clear, at least I would think it because I worked on it for months, <laughs> that you wouldn't see any problems going forward. Not so. Anthem has asserted a need for developmental testing. Now, I read all the materials that they sent us, including the phantom provider list that they sent, where not one of the 10 people they listed provided developmental testing. Only one even provided testing for children. There was someone on the list who provided therapy for adolescents who were confused about some kind of relationship issue. Um, so you can <laughs> You can't anticipate, am I running out of time? Okay. Um, and the materials that they provided didn't define what developmental testing was. So it's cognitive testing with a different label. They've agreed they will extend the treatment for this child. But I tell you this because it illustrates that no matter how clear the law and how clear your rights are, there will be denials. There will be denials that we haven't heard of or thought of before. You must challenge them. That's what Bob means by consumerism. You are the first line, whether you're a parent or you're a provider, you are the protector of that child. We will help you. Both departments, both regulators have help centers or consumer services division. I've put in the contact information in the materials. Call us or email us. We have people who will assist you. We want to know what the problems are. We're here to help. Thank you. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.